The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, today's message is going to be to encourage you to not let culture hijack who you really are. How many in agreement with that? You're in agreement with that? I don't want culture hijacking who God says I am. And so this is going to be kind of, a, a, a I think, an important review uh, for the fact that uh, uh, years ago, our, our friend Bill Morford, he wrote the One New Man Bible, and uh, the one thing he discovered that just thrilled me, and we've been teaching on it ever since, because I believe it reveals a significant truth uh, from the Bible. He found three double I am's. I am, I am. There's 30 some altogether in the scriptures, but there's three that were different. And I says, explain that to me. And he said, it's hard to explain except for the purpose of emphasis. And all the I am's, like truly, truly, verily, verily, that's a, a, a Hebrew uh, concept to say this is very important, and I'm repeating it on purpose. All right, verily, verily, truly, truly. I am, I am is meant for emphasis. But out of all the I am, I ams, and I don't know my Hebrew, but I'm just repeating what he told me. He said the I am, I am is the, is the word ani, ani. I am, I am. And it's there for what? Emphasis. Truly, truly, verily, verily. But he found three that really caught his attention. Isaiah 43, 11. Isaiah 43, 25. They're all in Isaiah. And Isaiah 51, 12, where instead of ani, ani, it was anohi, anohi. And I said, what's, what's that? He says, that's like emphasizing an emphasis. It's like saying, this is something that I can do that nobody else can do. All right, which actually then is healthy theology because listen to this. Here's the three double I am's. This is the, the God who made you. This is your Elohim, your creator God, the God who created you. All right, and if he made you, he made you in what? His image, according to his likeness, according to his plan. So we don't want culture telling us who we are. We want, we want to know if you want to know the purpose of a thing, never ask the thing. <laughs> if you want to know the purpose of something, you ask the creator or the manufacturer, if you really want to know. Okay? So we're going to ask and see, what does God say about himself? I am, I am. That's anohi, anohi, the Lord. And besides me, there's no Savior. Huh. Wow. If we just laid hold of that, so much for culture trying to tell us there's many roads to God. That just defies it right there. If the word of God is, is to be treated as the precious delivery of God revealing his heart to mankind, of which I, don't you believe he's totally capable? Uh, I heard someone recently say, well, the word of God's got a lot of problems. And I think, I think you got a lot of problems. <laughs> it's, it's probably a lot you don't like to hear. That's why you're saying that. But I am, I am. And besides me, there is none other. And some translations use deliverer, and some use savior. But nonetheless, he's the only one that can save or deliver you out of. And he's the only one, and there's none beside you. Everything else would be a substitute. You, you would find and create, even in culture, culture will find a substitute. But those are idols, and they don't produce. The second double I am, I am. And this church has been... Uh, 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 seen great progress literally around the world on reaffirming people uh, on a simple truth of forgiving from the heart. I am, I am, ano he, ano he, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. In other words, I am, I am your forgiver. And to really understand forgiveness from a biblical context, 
because uh, the world, when they forgive, they really cope. That's all they're doing. They're coping. Transformation, a supernatural transaction that takes place like the new birth, forgiveness is to do the same thing, unless we forgive from the heart. But yet the scripture also says nobody can forgive sins except who? God. So God is the only one that can forgive sins, but he tells us, you must forgive. So it's going to have to be in him. It's going to have to be the real you or the new creation reality, not just from your head, but Matthew 18 says, from the heart. When it's from the heart, that's the new creation you, the real you. And that's what we want to talk about today, the real you. We don't want you to be robbed uh, of, of your identity. It will hinder you from moving forward and upward and, and fulfilling uh, the purposes of God that has for you. Uh, if, if you try to form a life or a theory that's based on a false premise, it's going to go nowhere. And you're going to be shifting and zigzagging all through life trying to find what's really you. And I, I just love it how many people I prayed over over the years. that My favorite prayer was when God revealed to me that there never was another me, there never will be another me. There never was another you, there never will be another you. You are what you are and you're a one of a kind. Why in the world would you want to die a copy? Peer pressure does that though. It would like to make you be like something else. And the real you is so perfectly unique. Do you realize how precious that is? What if you found a precious stone that was unique? It was a one of a kind. It would be very valuable. Well, in the sight of God, that's exactly the way you are. There's no, oh, I think um, I'm going to create uh, millions and millions and billions of people, but I think I'll make some that are just losers. Yeah, yeah, I got to have some losers in the bunch. So I think I'll create some losers and some nobodies who are never going to mount to anything because there's nothing in them worth of any value. God don't think like that, but people do. And people buy into that. And that's what we want to get rid of today. I am, I am the one who cleanses you and blots out your transgressions. I am your forgiver, in other words. And no one can forgive sins except God. So when you forgive from the heart, it's got to be the God in you and you, the co-laboring. We all know the scripture, apart from me, you, that you can do nothing, but I can do all things through him, right? They that are joined to the Lord are what? One spirit with him. That's the new creation reality, and that's the real you. And the beautiful part is you're not only created in God's image, you're created a one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. Wow, that puts great responsibility on you to be you. You ever think of that? Oh my goodness, nobody else can be me except me. I got to be me. I'm going to break into song here on that. But uh, <laughs> uh, The third double I am. I am, I am. I know he, I know he. I'm saying this with great emphasis, emphasis because nobody can do this but God. I am, I am he who comforts you. Isaiah 51, 12. Comforts you. And what that's saying is when you look at people in their lives and trying to uh, find themselves, my generation, we all wanted to get on a motorcycle and go to California to find ourselves until we realized when we got to California, you were still the same. You didn't, you didn't really discover anything new about you. Uh, you just change geography. A lot of people change geography, titles, names, but the real them remains unchanged. Now, in these three aspects, when I meditated on that, uh, Bill would just thought it was interesting. And then scholars just, oh, that's interesting, and then they move on. Me, I fell in love with those three scriptures because I saw that if that was a revelation of the Father's heart, I am, I am. I mean, if my dad says, look at, I am, I am. The only one in this house that can do anything for you. <laughs> I am, I am the only one that can mete out discipline. And I am, I am the only one that can make you feel really good about yourself. I'd pay attention, wouldn't you? He's saying, if I am, I am, and there's no one that can save you, if this is the heart of the Father, trying to portray to his children who he is to you, it's going to reveal who I am by saying, I should be, if he's the father of lights, I should be the child of light. If, you know, I should, I should be a representative of him. I should be 
displaying him, the highest form of communication is to express a person, not just words, but to express a person. Jesus said it, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the highest form of communication, is to be able to have the Word of God expressed through your personhood. Be a living epistle. That's a high compliment, to be a living epistle, to be your life is read by all people. So I looked at those three verses of Scripture and I said, in order for me not to let uh, culture hijack the real me, which it's working at all the time by the prince of the power of the air, uh, uh, he wants to lead you into a disobedience. He wants to shape and mold you, you know, according to his image. Um, <clears throat> and, it's, and it changes that, that helps you get frustrated. Uh, he, uh, the enemy likes to frustrate you. So he'll, uh, he'll do something for a season, then the next season he'll say, no, 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 that's not right. Here's what you are. All right. Here's what you need to be. And your Bible will become political correctness or something. You, 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 you will live by a standard that is, that is fluctuating and uh, uh, changes back and forth. But... If these three scriptures reveal the heart of the Father to us as a child, as a son or a daughter, I believe these would be the three characteristics that would come forth from us. Remember, he comes in to express himself through us. So I said, well, I'm not a deliverer or savior. What would, if I take on Father's heart, what, how would that manifest in my life? And, and, and the Lord spoke to me and just said, you would be redemptive oriented. Redemption has always been the name of the game. It's never going to change. Redemption, God's heart is to redeem, to save, to deliver. Then you would have a redemptive mentality. You would be a solution-oriented person. You wouldn't just want to sit and argue and debate this or that. You would want to bring train, change lives. You would want to see many sons come to glory. Now, if and actually, Moses was considered a deliverer, wasn't he? But there's a, there's a kind of leading that draws people to God and to obedience to God. That's the kind of deliverer we should be. But in reality, just be redemptive orientated. And no matter what your walk of life is, you become acclimated to that kind of mindset. You're always looking for the solution. Jennifer always says, there's, there's, no, there's no problem that doesn't have an answer. It's just that wisdom will search out the answer rather than just going, oh, I don't know. <laughs> All right? Now, the second one, I am, I am, who blots out your transgressions for my sake. I am your forgiver. Nobody can forgive sin except God. Then what really revolutionized a lot of our ministry is we saw people getting uh, changed and transformed very easily through forgiving properly. And it's the opposite of what I see in the church, uh, not my congregation, but outside of our congregation, because you've had so much teaching uh, on forgiveness from the heart and that you have the tools to deal with whatever comes up. But outside, their solution is to vent. Christians I'm talking about, they vent. You know what venting means? Now, don't, don't give me no Bible. I don't want no Jesus stuff. What they're basically saying is, I want to fortify my anger and my hostility, and I do not want to forgive. That's really what they're saying in a nutshell. And my father says, if you don't forgive, your heavenly father won't forgive you. So Christianity that wants to vent, by the way, venting, your negative stuff, your stuff that's contrary to the gospel, contrary to the word of God, when you vent, you are like weightlifters, you're building a muscle. You're making it stronger. In the olden days, they used to say, oh, if you're angry, just punch a pillow. Well, that's the world's answer. You know what? While you're punching that pillow, you're fortifying your anger. You're feeding your anger. You will actually have a greater anger problem. There is no release apart from the forgiveness of God. You want to be the real you? You're going to be a forgiver like your father is. He paid a great price to give us that precious gift of forgiveness. You should be a forgiving people. It should be so automatic that if you hear somebody vent, you go, they don't go to Kingdom Life Church. It's the truth. I don't know of anybody in our church that vents. If you vent, you're not a Kingdom Life Church person. You're still old school 
go to church, be, try to be nice. And God didn't call you to be nice. There's nice people that are not saved. God's saying, if you won't forgive from the heart, your heavenly Father won't forgive you. But yet... I've given you grace. I've given you empowerment by having Jesus in you, the forgiver living in you, to do the work. You are without excuse saying, it's too hard. You don't understand what I've been through. Well, if any of you have heard Victoria's testimony recently, uh, it, it kind of makes you kind of bite the bullet on, you don't know what I've been through. Jesus can deliver from anything and he can forgive anything. So just settle that. If you're venting or complaining or backslidden, or offended, guess what? You're simply not living anywhere near a, a even moderate level of the gospel of Jesus. So you call yourself a Christian, but you vent, you're a long ways from living in the reality of the real you. The real you was created to be redemptive oriented, to see that forgiveness is by God and God alone. And what happens when you forgive? There is a supernatural exchange. Forgiveness is not from the mind alone. You have to start somewhere and say, I agree, I will, consent, but until you yield and obey from the heart. Matthew 18, unless you forgive from the heart. And how do I know if I forgave from the heart or from my head? Everybody in my church knows, but not everybody in the church acts on it. If you forgive from the heart, any pain... Hurt, any toxic emotion, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, is transformed into peace. The God of peace himself. You made peace with God, you have the peace of God, and the God of peace will crush the enemy. He's very militant. He will crush the enemy beneath your feet. But, but there has to be a supernatural transaction. It's like salvation. Now, talk about culture hijacking. Uh, I recently heard some guy who's preaching in his church, and it's a larger church. Uh, and he says, well, I, I mean, some people um, ask Jesus in their heart. I guess I'm okay with that. And you don't want to know the rest of what he said. There is a progressive Christianity that is trying to hijack who you really are. And it's trying to make you and mold you. Rather than letting God make and mold you into his image, it's trying to make and mold you into the match the culture. They've hijacked certain words like love. Guess what? Well, those two people committing adultery, they love each other. Shouldn't they be together? God is the only one that deserves the right to define the word love. And God is love and God is holy. That other word you're using, love, you're hijacking it. That is not biblical love. They've hijacked bigot. If you believe that that scripture, that Jesus is the only way, you're a bigot. They've hijacked tolerance. You have to tolerance even stupidity. Equality. Equality, the thing I loved about free enterprise is equality. What did equality mean? It means anybody from any walk of life can try. You might fail, you might succeed. But the way hijack they've hijacked equality now is that equal result. So if Jennifer's an A student and I'm a D student, uh, we're all going to pass and we're going to take away those grades because we need equal outcome. That's not equality. Jennifer's going, I'm not trying no more. Why should I? Dennis gets, Dennis gets a D and he gets the same reward that I get for getting an A. Equality is not equal opportunity, and you have a right to, to, to succeed, and you have a right to fail. You have a right to try, and you have a right to try again. You can make something out of your life, but I would get into the purposes of God and find out. And let's get away from this word that I see in, in churchianity of find your dream. You know, that, that can be a, a little bit of a cultural voice. It's not totally bad, but why find your dream? Why not use the word that's a little more biblical, like purpose, or better than purpose even, because I've seen that misused, assignment. You are called by God, created by God, unto good works. 
There is an assignment for you, and it's your obligation to pursue God and that assignment, not find your dream. Most of the time when you find your dream, you're just looking for carnally your preferences, what you would like. Uh, my dream is uh, to live on an island all by myself and be a total sovereign ruler. <laughs> and have a, oh no, I got, if I'm a sovereign, I got to have some people working for me. Feed me grapes and food and whatever. You know, that, that, not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about finding your assignment, and your assignment should resemble daddy, right? What does father do? He's redemption oriented. Your assignment will always include redemption. It will always include a forgiveness lifestyle to where you will, you will be God welcoming, but knowing too that what will separate them is their sin. You don't have to separate them. They will separate themselves by venting, anger, hostility, demanding their own way, or giving in and demanding culture, and them are one so that they are comfortable. There's churches that are even watering down the gospel to be comfortable in culture. I got news for you. Culture is going to eventually bite you anyway. <laughs> so that's a lose-lose scenario. That's like the people that thought, I think I'll make an alliance with Egypt and be safe. Yeah, that didn't work out scripturally. Whenever you're looking for an alliance or a, or a source other than God himself for your strength, it, it'll take you down with it. All right? I still have to get to the good stuff. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10. And we covered this uh, last week, too. This is one of the things we've used in our, in our module training because it is so accurate. We know it, uh, King James, New King James, we know it as... Uh, Primary, we, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments or high things that exalts themselves against the knowledge of God. So what's that saying? The weapons of our warfare, what do they do? They will cast down these arguments or lofty, proud, arrogant things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And what's interesting, uh, I don't know how many times it happens in, in life on, on television or whatever, but uh, with my eyes wide open, I saw a, pr a proud spirit transposed over a face of a man that I was trying to minister to. Uh, he couldn't tell him anything because he knew everything. Uh, <laughs> did you ever try to tell somebody that knows everything, anything? It's not easy, all right? But right over his face, I saw a bald, what looked like a Humpty Dumpty demon, and it had its head tilted back. You know, that's scriptural. When it describes pride, the head tilted back with a lofty, uh, I think the, the eyes looked condescending. Every now and then I see someone on television that makes me drop down to see if I can't discern his spirit because a lot of times they are, you could call that body language, but in reality you're talking down to people. You are coming to a place where you are superior. So the head's tilted back and there's a lofty look. All right. But I'm saying all of this for this reason. That uh, we use our powerful God tools. And this is a message translation, which is like a paraphrase. But a lot of times when in that expansion, it gives you words to work with. We use our powerful God tools. I like God tools better, the weapons of our warfare. Yeah, either one's good, right? The weapons of our warfare, but powerful God tools for smashing warp philosophies. So it's our responsibility to be like our God our Father to smash false philosophies, not let them dictate to who I am. Smash those warp philosophies, tearing down barriers. Mm, I want to get into this. Um, erected against the truth. And then here's that soulish nature of ours. It says, fitting, fitting every loose thought, emotion, and impulse. That's mind, will, and emotions. Fitting every loose impulse. That's the will. Emotion and thought into a structure of a life that's shaped by Jesus. Our tools are ready and at hand for cleansing 
are clearing the ground of every obstruction so we can build a life of obedience unto maturity. Full stature, that's, that's our primary course. People think we're inner healers, uh, but for the most part, all we did was show them that if you're going to build a life of maturity, uh, uh, forgiveness is essential. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. All right? If we're going to be any kind of an indication of the real us. To have someone vent or complain or criticize. What are the, the uh, six deadly C's? criticize, complain. You know, they, they died in the wilderness because of those things. So it doesn't matter how much you know. If you criticize, complain, conceal, compare, compete. I don't know what I'm missing, but you get the point, right? Those are all deadly seas. You don't want to walk in life with those being emanated from you. Now, Bringing this loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a structure of a life that's shaped by Jesus. Our tools are ready and at hand. And, and the reason I like the, uh, the paraphrase message translation for this is because it exonerates uh, what we teach that you and Jesus can do it. You know, we, we've gone against the grain for many years when we travel church to church because what the church expected was for us to go to them, lay hands, and they would be better. We're turning around. Matter of fact, I even had a lady one time came up for prayer, and I said, okay. I said, now let the Jesus in you. I'm trying to get into a place of agreement where the Jesus in me can meet the Jesus in you. And, we're, and I came up here for you to pray for me. Now you're asking me to actually go to my Jesus in me. <laughs> I didn't want to do this. I want you to do it to me. We're trying to train people that the Jesus in you can do the work. It says it's clearing the ground of every obstruction, building lives of obedience. These tools are ready and at hand. Well, if they're ready and at hand, does that mean I got to call up Joe Heavy Speaker? Does that mean I have to be in a group setting? It says they're ready at hand. That means while I'm driving, you know. Lord told me that one time. It was I thought it was very interesting. I've uh, repented uh, several times now. It's always on video, so they, everybody can go back and look at it. Sometimes they don't remember a message, but if you confess your sin, they remember that part. All right. But God once told me, He says, "You know, Dennis, you're teaching on walking in the Spirit. How about driving in the Spirit?" Oh, oh. I guess I'm not driving in the Spirit as well as I walk in the Spirit. Okay. And then, then. God gave me that beautiful kingdom-minded woman, Jennifer, who gave me the best sermon I ever heard in the kitchen where things happen. Honey, I was thinking. Right then I go, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, help me. She was thinking, oh, Jesus. The road is a microcosm of the kingdom. I'm already convicted. I know where she's going with this. The road. And God places those people. You know that slow person that goes 20 miles an hour in a 55? In the passing lane. And you can't get around because someone else is going 20 in the right lane. It's God's road. And those are God's people. And he strategically placed them to see what's in your heart. I'm going, whoa, I saw stuff in my heart that was not good. <laughs> Apparently, everyone did not go to the Dennis Clark School of Driving. And then Jennifer says, and keep in mind, you know what? Love is patient. Love is kind. The kingdom of God is love. And, and also, too, there's a bell curve. You know what a bell curve means? There's people at all levels. Some of them are skilled drivers, and some of them have never driven on a four-lane highway before. Someone might be going to the hospital because someone is, is in a bad state. You don't know the condition of what's going on around you. That'll get your patience going a little bit better. All right. That's your free part. So if you don't remember anything we're talking about, uh, about coming into the real you and not letting culture hijack it, you will remember that you need to practice this presence on the road, not just in the walk. All right. A true walk in the spirit includes driving. All right. Now, uh, 
<clears throat> we want to actually minister. I want to minister to those watching by video particularly because it's going to be timeless. I want to minister to false personalities. I want to minister to any place that the culture, perhaps, just living life. You were either cursed with words or you yourself did it to yourself. You know, like, I'm stupid. Most of the time that didn't come from somebody else. That came from all by yourself. You got that. Most dysfunction you did all by yourself. You didn't even need a lot of help. But we're going to get rid of any of that. Anything that comes against the new creation reality is a false personality, and it needs to come down. And I don't care how much proof you have, because you could fail 10 times in a row and say, I'm a failure. See? And I can prove it. I got 10 failures. 10 failures doesn't make you a failure. Though the righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. And it's not a limited number. All right? He gets back up. It's, a, it's, about, it's about trusting in the efficacy of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God who knows beyond anything you know and he is so smart he can fix anything that you messed up. Can you imagine that being that smart? Is that kind of an understatement? God has so much wisdom that he could actually fix any mistake you think is too complicated for your little pea brain. Well, it probably is too complicated for your little pea brain. That's why you go to him. Search me, O oh God. David was smart. Search me, O oh God, for secret faults. That's the height of humility. That's not a know-it-all. That's not someone that says, oh, I know the Bible inside out and back. I don't need to deal with anything. It's all those other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the blame game, which is not forgiveness, by the way. But he says, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Anxious thoughts, hurtful ways. Emo cognition, emo volition. The emotions are controlling your thinking. Your emotions are controlling your choices. Search me, God, for those things, and I will receive forgiveness and get them cleansed out of my heart and let the peace of God rule. That's the way Jesus is ruling, and he's Lord. All right, so anyway, we're going to deal with some lies here. We're going to make this part practical now. If, we're, if God is our Father and we're His children, then um, I need to understand how a lie operates. Uh, first of all, everything you hear in your head, just nod your head, everything you hear in your head, all right, has with it, and this is the part that people skip. We are so cerebral sometimes, even in the church, we skip the fact of the Spirit. There is a line of communication. Those are the actual words, like, I'm stupid. Someone, you can communicate that to yourself. Someone could tell you that. I'm stupid. Behind that is a line of authority. Whose authority is attached to those words? Everything you hear in your head has two parts, a line of authority or power behind those words, and it's either the power of God or the flesh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. A line of authority along with the line of actual content. That's why I don't just judge prophecy by whether it's scriptural. I judge by the nature that you can feel in the spirit behind the prophecy. I don't judge a sermon by the content of the sermon. I judge I'm all always aware of the flavor behind it. Have you ever heard of an angry preacher? Come on. Is there such a thing? Uh -huh. But what they said may be true. So the line of communication could be scriptural, but the line behind it could be something that needs to be eradicated. I've read Christian books where you could feel the author was angry. Fortunately, that's not the mainstay because most Christian books, uh, someone was inspired, someone that had a, a real heart for that topic, all right? But I'm just saying it, it can happen. No. Uh, dealing with lies, understanding those two things. So everything you hear in your head, don't just look at content. We want to know what's behind that content. Who started that? Who's the initiator? Is it God, self, or the devil? Or is it the world trying to make me think a particular way? Am I being hijacked by my culture? Is it the voice of the world, the voice of the flesh, the demonic voice, or the voice of God? 
That's our responsibility. That's not someone else's responsibility to tell you. You have to develop that within yourself. You are his sheep. His sheep hear his voice. You have to be able to differentiate between the voice of the world, the voice of the flesh, the voice of the devil. Right? No. Let's start to get cleaned up, just in case that applies to anybody listening. <laughs> Though we, we've dealt with everything. That this must be for someone else. Aunt Cecilia needs this message. Yeah. I remember the one lady we tried to deal with with getting her to submit her will to Jesus. And she bought every, in those days it was cassettes, she bought every cassette on our table to give to her relatives who needed to change. (laughs) I was like, I hope she listens to them for herself first. (laughs) But you know, sometimes that's the way it works. They are the problem, not me. And there's no redemption in that. That's not like dad. My father, God, he's what? He's a redemptive-oriented father. We should be redemptive-oriented, and we should be forgiving. And if we comfort somebody, doesn't the Scripture say comfort them with the same comfort whereby you've been comforted? You can't give true comfort unless the Holy Spirit's ever ministered it to you. Whatever you're giving is a substitute. You're giving them a placebo. You're giving them a fake substitute. Because any kind of comfort that's not the Holy Spirit is not true comfort. I am, I am your comforter, and there's none besides me. Anohi, anohi, I am your comforter. Pay attention, any false comfort. I don't care if it's comfort food. I don't care if it's chocolate. Oh, boy, they're going to start throwing stuff now. I don't care if it's cake, chocolate, whatever. That is not true comfort. That's a preference. Comfort is, in its truest sense for a believer, is the Holy Spirit. He comforts you while you're fasting. Oh, now you're messing. Okay, now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with this, dealing with lies. First of all, I want us, everybody that's listening to start by doing what we did when we traveled. We used to, uh, even printed out on little cards, the Living Bible Translation of Romans 14.4. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him, not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. What do you suppose that verse is implying? They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him and not to you. What do you think that's saying? Let go, release. You don't own them. You are confusing stewardship with ownership. Mothers, even those children of yours, you don't own them. You are part of your assignment was to steward them. Jason's got a, a, a wonderful series that I really recommend everybody get. It's on the online store now. And it's, it's covering stewarding your affection, stewarding uh, the fear of the Lord, etc., etc. Stewarding is almost a lost art because we click into ownership. Ownership and stewardship are opposite. So, How are we going to get rid of that? We're going to start releasing people right now. Releasing your children is not abandoning your children. It's not rejecting your children. It's simply releasing them into the loving, capable hands of God who can do things for them in their behalf without you and without strings. Uh Uh-oh. We're going to sever some strings right now. And we're going to release people that you've judged in the past. You will not be truly free to be the real you until you've released them because the blame game is over. From the day you got born again, it was essential to understand that blame doesn't work anymore. Actually, when you blame, you're only revealing what you're failing to do yourself. It's in you. Mirroring image. Listen to the culture. If they call you as a Christian a hater, they're hating while they're doing it. It's like a mirror. If you, want, you don't even have to discern. With a person who's venting, you don't have to discern. You see what their problem is. For one, I don't want to forgive. You don't understand what I've been through. Don't tell me what Jesus said. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. Let's release those people right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, knowingly or unknowingly, if there's people that I've been hanging on to, trying to control, thinking I'm doing the loving thing, finding some kind of a, uh, an image that I'm 
but I, God, you are in control. And Lucifer took control and said, I will. And it didn't go well. So Father, right now, my will belongs to God. And I release so-and-so. I release whosoever. And from my will, from my heart, the door of my heart, the will, it's in my spirit. It opens the door to release whosoever. I release them from demands and expectations. I, I am enjoying now. After you release them, you know how you can tell if you release it? You will have a, a, a romance of wills with Jesus. My will, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Uh, it's a dance of the wills, as one lady said. It's a dance of the wills. It's a romance of wills. Because in his will is pleasure forevermore. There's pleasure. Pleasure in his will. It's not religious drudgery. If you bought into that, culture taught you that, religion taught you that, but that's not the voice of God. There's pleasure in yielding to the assignment of God's will. It's a dance of wills. And when that will, uh, what, are, what are some of the other things we've heard lately? Uh, the, uh, uh, someone says, uh, uh, nestle, don't wrestle. <laughs> Snuggle, don't struggle. Ro dance of wills. It's a romance. And it's something that when you yield to it, he empowers you and strengthens you. And it's full of pleasure. Now, if you've released everybody, they are God's servants and I'm After many years of teaching this, God had me turned it on me and say, okay, now, Dennis, now I want you to say, I am God's servant and not my own. I belong to him and not to me. Oh, no, that went a little bit deeper. Let's do that one, all right? Because we want to get into the reality of the real you. So if you hear anything, because they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him, those he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So if there's any basic lie, it'll say, I'm a mistake, I'm flawed, uh, I, I'm ashamed, I'm defective, uh, any of those kinds of thinking, if you have any of those, I want you right now, Holy Spirit, reveal anything that I'm saying about myself that comes against the new creation reality. Come on, everybody probably has something, and you've identified with it for so long. You've heard it in your head for so long. You think that's who you are. That is not who you are. That is not the real you. It's something that you bought into. I am what? A mistake, flawed, bad, ashamed, defective. Uh, I mean, it could be anything. But right now, I receive forgiveness. I receive forgiveness. And you know what's nice about this, if you really understand it? If you receive forgiveness... <clears throat> God takes it away and throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. But now you need to understand that sea of forgetfulness is here. You live at peace with yourself. This is the only place it gets erased. It doesn't get erased up here. This is the historical record. All Kingdom Life Church people know this. This is the historical record and it's there for... We see David's sins in the Bible, right? There's a historical record, yet God says, David is a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Why? Because forgiveness, it's thrown in the sea of forgetfulness, and in the heart you're clean. The book of heaven has washed you from that. That's how significant forgiveness and repentance is. It's clean. The heavenly record is clean, but the historical record is there for correction and reproof. You don't want to do it again. Don't we see David's sins in the Bible? They didn't get erased, not from the Bible, not from history. You must make a distinction between the historical record of your sin and the heavenly record. And that's why forgiveness and repentance must involve a supernatural transaction to where it changes to peace. Because he's the only one that can take 
away your pain, your shame, your anger, your hurt. And as a matter of fact, you did not forgive if you forgave verbally and still have hurt. Why? No transaction. There was nothing supernatural about that. You just gave lip service to forgiveness. Forgiveness is a supernatural transaction that takes away the hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, whatever needed to be washed away because only Jesus himself can take it away. This is where they used to call uh, us uh, uh, an inner healing ministry, but most inner healers have a far more complicated procedure and far more closely related to psychology. All right? Those things are good to know and understand, but in reality, I'd rather know Him, that I might know Him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of His person. Jennifer was a, were you a baby Christian at the time you were taking your advanced things in psychology? And she basically read about all the different uh, crazy stuff, and she goes, it's, it's demonic. <laughs> they got names for it, but it's demonic. It's when an enemy's personality is trying to infiltrate and attach itself like a hitchhiker even to a Christian so that you own it and say, that's me. One of the first things we teach people is when you hear a voice that's contrary to the new creation, contrary to scripture, the first thing you ought to say is, that's not me. That's at least a, a simple beginning. That's not an end in itself. You can't just walk around saying, that's not me, that's not me. You need to deal with that voice. And the only way to silence that voice the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God. They're pulling down, casting down arguments and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. You have the tools. They're ready. They're at hand. And you need to be able to receive forgiveness. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Did you know that the, the, the new creation is the real you? Uh, but the false personality has a life of its own. Do you have friends or relatives? especially unsafe, that are, that are living, they're living so far beneath what you know their potential could be. But they're a product of someone else's words. You'll never amount to anything. Now I have an excuse to not amount to anything. <laughs> and every failure, I go, well, what do you expect? A false personality causes the person to not even seek ministry or argue with it because it's been so much a part of them, that's the way I am. But we're supposed to be, with our God tools, casting down arguments and every high thing, not just accepting them. Well, you're stupid, Dennis. Okay, I guess so. I can prove it. I got D on that last paper. I must be stupid. Okay, you can always fortify it. But if that's not who you are, a false personality, it, it takes on a life of its own uh, because the, it, it, will, it will always get historical collaboration to prove that you really are that false thing. So, but the new creation is the real you. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? The natural man doesn't understand the things of the spirit. So you don't want to be the natural man. You want to be the supernatural child of God, the new creation you. And uh, I always liked it, the, the, face, the face of the new birth. And even in James it says, your nat when a man looks at his natural face in a mirror, that word natural is actually Genesis. When you look at your Genesis face, the face of your birth, of who God made you to be, as long as you don't walk away and become a forgetful here. You begin to walk in who you really are, your Genesis face. We see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Someday we'll see face to face. But we all with unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. If you've repented of any voice that you hear in your head that's clearly against Scripture or against the new creation reality, then you need to understand the process now. Once you're free and you're not tolerating anything that's not scriptural in your head 
and you know how to go there, right? You have to get the power behind the word or you're not going to accomplish anything. If there's fear behind you're a failure, you better deal with the fear or you'll never, you can renounce, I'm not a failure, I'm not a failure, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a failure, I'm not a failure. All you're doing is fortifying the fear. Every thought has a corresponding emotion. And so all you cerebral people better get a handle on that because oftentimes even biblical people are very proud of how cerebral they are. But you could have been cerebral without getting saved. That mind, you don't need knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. What you really need is wisdom. The wisdom of application to know what to do with what you have. Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the ability to use knowledge right. And God says, the new creation is the real you. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. Remember, there's three levels of oneness. There's oneness when you're born again. There's a oneness that comes by a progressive work of the cross in your life or sanctification to where you and God, you're resembling Him more and more. Progressive, and there's a lot of times a crisis experience of the cross to bring you into the levels. I speak to you, like John said, little children. I speak to you, young men. I speak to you, fathers. He was speaking to three levels of maturity. So there is a progression in that maturity to be transformed. You should all be pursuing to be mothers and fathers in the spiritual sense as sons and daughters. You don't want to be a child forever. Now, the new creation is the real you. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into that image. If anyone is in, is in Christ, he's a new creation. And that face of your new birth. But here's, here's something that I, I found really interesting. If you want to see how to move from victory to victory, faith to faith, how this process works, the first place is when you forgive and you repent, there's a change of garments. You're putting off the flesh and you're putting on. And for all those people that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that think drop down doesn't mean anything, it's coming from the Greek word enduo. Enduo is to sink into in order to be clothed. You go down before it goes up. Enduo in the scriptures is in our Bibles, English Bibles, put on. Put on the Lord Jesus, put on the new man, put on. It's enduo. To sink into in order to be clothed as in a garment. It's kind of like water baptism to me. You sink into the element to be submerged in it. You go down for it to cover. Well, you want to be covered and let the Lordship of Jesus rule in your life? Let the peace of God rule? You got to go to the peace. I'm sorry. There's no peace up here. Peace is here and it will guard your heart and your mind. There's no substitute to that except ranting, railing, complaining, Change of clothes is the first step. You're poor, naked, and blind. God said, I want you to have white garments. He means you need to put off all of that indifference, put off the sin, put off the pride, put off those things, and put on. Sink into Him and be clothed in Him. Now, after you do that, what happens is He says, I'm going to teach you to strengthen. And it has nothing to do with age. I speak to you little children. I speak to you young men. I speak to you fathers. In that maturation process, if I can teach you to wait upon the Lord, you will have strength that will mount up like wings of eagle, and you will run and not faint. Even if the young people faint, you won't. That's a supernatural strength. So you're putting on supernatural clothing, and you're putting on supernatural strength, and you're going to go from strength to strength, glory to glory. You're going to move forward. You're going to move to another level of glory. And there's a glory of level coming to the church that's already here, and God's waiting for a people who will open up and be that corporate portal to be that facilitator of what He wants to do through you. It's not going to just fall out of heaven. It's going to come out of the hearts. The people that were in Solomon's temple were in one accord when they were as one. Upper room, started with 500 people, but there's only 120 in the upper room to get one accord. But in that one accord, they created a portal for God to give them the promise of empowerment 
God wants empowerment back into your life. He wants you to get back in the image, to go forward, to get back into the image that God's had for you. Uh, if there's any uh, false personalities, we're going to unmask the deceiver. I'm going to just give you a list of a few of over 40-some years of ministry. We've heard all of these. So nobody's that unique. And, the, and, and really, you know what? Satan is not that creative. He's very repetitious in his devices and his tactics. I'm a bad person. If you knew the real me, you would reject me. You know how many people withdraw from people? They're called shy or introverts. Or, you know, there is an introvert and there is an extrovert. But the point is, there's some people withdraw for the wrong reason. They're afraid that if you knew the real me, you'd reject me. My identity is a shameful person. This is who I am. I'm ashamed. They walk with a cloak of shame. I've got so many shortcomings, I'll never be able to overcome them. They only hear a teaching like this and say, oh, but if you knew how many things I'd have to deal with. So what? So quit? There's too much? You know, we have Jennifer's life transformation was 60 days, and we call it the 60-day challenge. It was actually less than 60 days. And it was radical life transformation. If you can't give 60 days, you're not a kingdom life person for sure, and you're not a real Christian. You're in name only. What do we call them? Chinos. Christian in name only. Sino. I don't know. What do we call them? We'll call them needing redemption. <laughs> All right? I'm trapped, helpless, hopeless. That's never true. Hope. Jesus in you is the hope of glory. So don't tell me there's, it's hopeless. That's an impossibility. Uh, one of the common ones is, I'm a victim. It's everybody else. I'm damaged goods. I'm inadequate. I'm a disappointment. That one is very common based on the voice they heard from, sometimes from parents. And if not from parents, they did it to themselves. <laughs> I'm disappointed. But all of those things being spiritually inferior. I'm on the outside looking in. How many dozens of people did we minister to and see breakthrough when we got them to come out? They felt like they were in this, their whole life was inside this canister and they, they were observing life by looking out, but they were not involved. If you have any of that, that is, that is a fear guard. We've dealt with this a lot of time and it is demonic. It's a guard that says, the illustration we use is, if there was a knockdown, drag out fight with mom and dad and you hid in the closet, demons don't play fair with little kids. They'll tell you, it's too dangerous in that knockdown, drag out fight in the living room, but you're safe here with me hiding in the closet. It's just two different aspects of fear. You didn't go into the safety that's in Jesus. You went to another form of fear. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, from the days ahead, we're going to remove, we're going to remove all these ungodly, ungodly common lies that are associated with the world of flesh and the devil. And I receive forgiveness this very day for any allowing anything to mar the image of who I am. And I pray this in Jesus' name. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.